The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today, we are going to talk about the vibration of continuous systems. Not covered on the quiz, but uh, it's a really important part of real-world vibration. And the most uh, the easiest, one of the easiest ones to demonstrate, I've shown you this one before, is the taut string. But I want to show you something un unusual about something you may not know about strings. Wait till it calms down here a little bit. OK, so this is your guitar string or a piano string. It's, a, it's under tension. We've already seen that it exhibits natural frequencies and mode shapes. So there's the first mode, looks like half a sine wave has a particular frequency associated with it. The, uh, get it to stop doing that so I can get to do, but if I excite it at twice the frequency, I don't know if I can do this, there we go. That turns out to be exactly twice the frequency of the first. The mode shapes one full sine wave. The mode shapes for a taut string are sine n pi x over l. But strings can do something else kind of neat. And that is, if I hit this thing, if I wait till it calms down here, if I give this thing just a pulse, what do you expect to see? You're going to see vibration? Tell me what you see. What's that act? What do you see happening? Something running back and forth, right? What you're seeing is wave propagation. It's not really vibration. Vibration we see of its modes and standing waves and things like that, right? So the, the taut string behaves, satisfies an equation of motion that's called the wave equation. And we're going to talk about quite a bit about that this morning. And the wave equation has, has this name, gives something away. The wave equation describes continuous systems of a particular kind that support traveling waves. And so the string will both support. I can give it a little pluck. I'll try to just place it in a particular shape and let go. There it is. And that little pluck just goes back and forth and back and forth at a particular speed. So is there a relationship between the speed at which things can travel in a string and the natural frequencies of a string? We'll, we'll, we'll get into that today. And I'm going to start by just showing you a little something that comes from my research. And let's see. Let me do this. I think this will work. Hear that? Now, what ha what's the, as I go slower, does frequency go up or down? It's kind of slow, and I'm going to speed up. All right? Goes up as the speed goes up. So that's results of the phenomenon called flow-induced vibration. And if you have, I'll give you a little, very uh, <clears throat> brief intro to flow-induced vibration. You have a cylinder sitting still, flow coming by it, water or air. And it's, let's see, the cylinder is diameter d, velocity u for the flow. What happens behind, in the wake of that cylinder, vortices are formed. It's just like if you're paddling a canoe or something and stick a paddle in the water, you'll see vortices shed off the side. And if you, first you get one that's positive and then one that's negative, and so one full cycle of this is from here to here. 
So that's, there's a sh frequency to this shedding. And the shedding frequency, Fs in hertz, <coughs> can be predicted by a simple dimensionless parameter called the Struhall number, STU over D. And that's approximately 0.2 U over D for stationary cylinders. You can predict the frequency at which these vortices are shed. Now, associated with the shedding of vortices is a lift force. And I'll call it some FL cosine omega t, which is 2 pi Fs times t. So this, at this frequency of vortex shedding, there is a transverse force. And there's actually an inline force also, which I'll call Fd for drag. And it goes like cosine 2 omega s times t. It's twice the frequency of that. And so you get some inline oscillatory excitation and what we call cross-flow oscillatory excitation. And this is the, this is the uh, <clears throat> cause of lots of things that we, we, the people who work on it call flow-induced vibration. Now, an amazing thing happens is if this is cylinder is elastically mounted or is flexible and that force starts to act on it, it will begin to vibrate. And the amazing thing is it begins to vibrate. It correlates the shedding of these vortices all along the cylinder. So it's like soldiers marching in step going across the bridge. And you know, you know, if everybody's walking randomly, then the bridge doesn't respond too much. But if everybody marches together, you can put a pretty good excitation into it. Well, the motion of the cylinder itself organizes these vortex shutting all along the cylinder, so they're all marching in step, and that means the force is all correlated on the length, and you can get some pretty substantial response. So that's the subject called flow-induced vibration, and with that, I'm going to show you a few slides. It'd be good if we let's dim the dim the lights a little bit, if you could, to see this. There's some pictures I just want you to see better. All right, so I do flow-induced vibration. I've been doing this, working on this for all my professional career, and it's applied primarily to big, flexible cylinders in the ocean, particularly associated with the things that the US Navy does, long cables and things, and also the offshore oil industry. Next slide. Can we dim the lights? Can we dim the lights? I want you to be able to see. This is a tension leg platform. It's one of the structures that's used in the offshore industry to produce oil. And you, it might, one of these might be moored in 3,000 feet of water, 1,000 meters of water, might weigh 20,000 tons. And what's connecting it, what holds it in place, are steel cylinders a half a meter in diameter, 3,000 feet long, going vertically down from each of those three pontoon legs sticking out. And they're under a lot of tension. And in, and in fact, it pulls the thing down into the water. So there's X, the, X, the buoyancy of the whole thing puts tension on these cylinders. But now, what happens if an ocean current comes by those cylinders? Vortex shedding and the cylinders vibrate. And if they vibrate over time, they will fatigue and fail. OK, next slide. There's a picture of a real one. That's a bigger one called Marco Polo. It's on a launch ship, it'll take it out to the site that it is, and then uh, it'll be, the ship will lower and it'll slide off. So these are big. Next slide. This is a, a, a diagram of the Gulf of Mexico. South America is at the bottom. Yucatan Peninsula is sticking up there right in the middle of the bottom. This is a picture, satellite imagery, of currents in the Gulf of Mexico. And there's a current that flows up off of South America into the Gulf of Mexico, goes around in a loop, and then come out, you can see Florida sticking down in there on the right. That current comes out of the Gulf, goes around the tip of Florida, and goes up the Atlantic coast and is known as the Gulf Stream. But it starts as a big current that comes into the Gulf of Mexico. And every now and then, that current pinches off an eddy. And that's what that red circle is in the middle. And it's an eddy that's many, many kilometers in diameter with surface currents on the order of a meter per second or more. And those are the most, the biggest threat to, for, to, in, for, for causing flow-induced vibration failures of long members from uh, hanging off of offshore structures. Next. 
So I've been doing research in this area for a long time. This is a picture taken in the summer of 1981. It is a piece of steel pipe, about two inches in diameter, and 75 feet long. It's under 750 pounds of tension, and it's pinned at each end. It, is, it behaves almost exactly like my rubber cord here. It has natural frequencies, and it will vibrate if a current comes by it. So this is actually a sandbar. And at low tide, we do all the work putting it up. Then as the tide comes in, the flow is perpendicular to the cylinder. And it, vortices be, start shedding. And as the pipe begins to move, they get organized all along the length. And a typical response mode was when the vortex shedding frequency, therefore the lift force frequency, coincided with a natural frequency, then you'd expect it to give quite a bit of response. The diagram on the left is if you cut the cylinder and look down its axis, this is the trajectory that you'd see the cylinder make. It would sit there and just make big figure eights. So up and down, vertical is its vertical motion. The flow's coming from, say, left to right. Its vertical motion is up and down, inline motions like this, and they are in exactly such a phase. It just makes big, beautiful figure eights. That's the kind of motion you'd see. OK? So then. Um, so very much what I was talking about a minute ago, very much behavior dominated by vibration. Vibration in the third mode, cross flow, was a typical one, and fifth mode, inline, was typical. But <clears throat> that's a real, as cylinders go in the ocean, that was kind of short. Third mode vibration is sort of low. <coughs> so as years have gone by, and oil is being produced in deeper and deeper and deeper water. The cylinders we're putting out there get longer and longer and longer and longer, and the modes that are excited by currents coming by get quite high. So this is an experiment we did. It was roughly a one-tenth scale model. The model is almost two inches in diameter, 500 feet long. Scale that up by a factor of 10, you're up around 20 inches in diameter and 5,000 feet long, which is exactly the size of the drilling riser that BP had hung off the drilling ship when the blowout occurred. It's a piece of steel pipe, 21 inches in diameter, 3 quarters of an inch wall thickness, 5,000 feet long, under a lot of tension. And it, when ocean currents come by, it behaves just like this string. Okay? And so we're out. This is a 110 scale model. So we put a big weight on the bottom of the cylinder, put it behind a boat, and towed it in the Gulf Stream. Next picture. So there's the boat. It's an oceanographic vessel. It's actually a catamaran. Next. This is a spool that had our test cylinder on it. Could lower that. There's a reddish object down in the bottom, which is, where's the? That's a 750 pounds piece of railroad wheel. And it's the weight on the bottom. And so you'd spool this thing off, lower it down, and then do your test. Next. Top, we measured tension, inclination, um, and then it also had a, it's a pin joint at the top, so it would vibrate freely. Inside, though, were, was fiber optics. Next. We had eight optical fibers, and in those optical fibers were what we call optical strain gauges. So we had 280 optical strain gauges instrumented up and down that pipe so we could measure its vibration. And so you're looking at a cross-section of the pipe. There were two optical fibers in each quadrant. And each one of those fibers had uh, 35 sensors on it. <coughs> Next. So this is a typical uh, experimental case. This is the surface. This is 500 feet down. This is the current profile. So the flow velocity is about 2 feet per second near the surface, up to 4 feet per second down on the bottom. And this is the region where most of the excitation was coming from that would drive the flow-induced vibration. This is measured RMS strain caused to, by the bending vibration of, in the cylinder. So it peak up about, the maximum strain is about right there. Next. Typical response spectrum, basically the frequency content at three different locations, down deep, in the middle, near the top. This is frequency. So this would be the peak that describes the principal cross-flow vibration at the vortex shedding frequency. Next. This pipe, this is position, bottom to top. This is time, 
And these are strain records from all of those strain sensors. There's a strain sensor about every uh, two meters along here. But what you're seeing is this is evidence. These red, the red is the amplitude, and red, let's say red is positive strain, and blue is negative strain. And so at any location on the pipe where it's vibrating, it's going to go from red to blue, red to blue, red to blue. And, but it's showing you that they're highly correlated all along the length, that there's a red streak all lined up. But it's not parallel to the pipe. It's inclined. This is showing you wave propagation. The behavior of the pipe was completely dominated by wave propagation, not by standing wave vibration. So totally different than that short pipe in 1981. And the wave equation So let's imagine we have a long pipe or string like that, and it can carry waves traveling along it. And the, the position at any location on here, here's a coordinate x. We describe the motion at a point by a coordinate w of x and t. So it's a function of where it is and time. And the way the, what describes the motion of something which obeys the wave equation is the following equation. Partial squared w with respect to x squared equals 1 over c squared partial squared w with respect to t squared. That's what's known as the one-dimensional wave equation. And the one-dimensional wave equation governs an incredibly broad category of uh, physical phenomena. Light behaves is according to the wave equation. Spe sound propagating across the room to you is governed by the wave equation. Longitudinal vibration of rods torsional vibration of rods, all governed by the wave equation. So it's worthwhile to know a little bit about the wave equation. And what I showed you this morning, it has this kind of duality to it. You can have things that vibrate with standing waves and mode shapes, but the same system can support waves that travel along it. So let's figure out why, why that is. So I'm going to do the derivation for you of the, uh, of the wave equation for a string, just so you, where you know it comes from, because then that general derivation applies to all these different things. So imagine you've got now a, we're going to, we're interested in eventually getting to vibration, so I'm going to make this a finite length string. And it has, this position we'll describe as a W of x and t. It has a tension, t, a mass per unit length, m. So this is like kilograms per meter is the mass per unit length of this thing, which can vibrate. So tension, mass per unit length, uh, l, the length of it. What other parameters do we need? That'll, that'll do for the moment. Now, so let's draw it again without, in some displaced position. And what's exciting, it may be my vortex shedding. And so I'm going to draw on it excitation here. And that will describe as a f of x and t, some force per unit length. So this has units of newtons per meter. Now, in that little, there may also be drag forces, the fluid damping. So I'm going to cut out a little piece of this cylinder and do a force balance. on that piece of cylinder. So basically, F equals MA. We're just applying Newton to this piece of cylinder. And I'll draw it right here. It's a little section of it. It's curved. Here's horizontal. There's horizontal. We need to evaluate all the forces on it. So the tension on this end is 
like that. And the tension on this end is some different angle. And this we'll call theta 1. This we'll call theta 2. And along here are my excitation forces, F of X and T. There may be some resistance, drag forces, damping. That'll be a damping constant, R of X, which is force per unit length per unit velocity, times uh, the force on this would be have to be multiplied by the velocity, so the derivative of, the of this displacement with respect to time, that's the force along here, and it can vary with position. And if we accounted for everything, ah, well, we, this is position x, and this is at x plus dx. So this little element is dx in length. And this is all for small motions. And if you assume small motions, then you can say theta 1 is approximately equal to uh, sine theta 1. That's also approximately equal to 10 theta 1. And that's equal to the derivative of w with respect to x, it's just the slope. We're going to take advantage of that. And theta 2, same thing. It's approximately equal to the uh, to tan theta 2 here, and sine, and all those things. But that then, the slope has changed a little bit when you go from through dx. And this is equal to the slope on the left-hand side plus the rate of change of the slope. times dx. So slope on the left, this is now the slope on the right-hand side. And so now all that's left to do is to write a force balance for that little piece. On the element dx. So positive upward. We have a t <coughs> sine theta, but because sine theta is approximately tan theta is equal to dw dx, then there's an upward force on the right-hand side, which is t And this turns into partial squared w with respect to x squared dx. So on the right-hand side, positive upwards, you have t times the partial of w with respect to x plus partial squared w with respect to x squared dx. That's the upward force on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have a downward force, minus t, partial of w with respect to x. And you notice that this one's going to cancel that one. We have minus r of x, partial w with respect to t. That's the velocity, dx long, because that's force per unit length. And have we missed anything? So that's the sum of the external forces on this little slice. And that has to be equal to, what did Newton say? The mass, which is the mass per unit length, times dx is the total mass, times the acceleration, partial squared w with respect to t squared. Okay. So this cancels this term, 
And then you notice I'm left with everything is just a function, something dx, something dx, something dx. Get rid of the dx's. And I can write. Oh, let's see, did I leave? I left out something. I left out my distributed force, f of x and t dx. It's positive as it's drawn. It's over here also. So this, and I cancel out that dx. So I have put them all together now and assemble them. I can write down the equation that governs this motion. So t partial squared w with respect to x squared minus r of x times velocity plus f of x and t equals m partial squared w with respect to t squared. And that just says that the sum of the forces on the object equals its mass times its acceleration. Now, if we're interested in natural frequencies and mode shapes, how do, when, we, when we've been doing one and two degree freedom systems and we want to get the natural frequencies and mode shapes, we temporarily let the damping be zero and the force be zero, right? So we want to do the same thing now. We're interested in uh, how do you find the omega ends and what I call the psi ends, because now the mode shapes are functions. And so this is the natural frequency and the mode shape for mode n. And we know there's lots of modes. So we let r of x and f of x and t be 0. And when we do that, I'm going to divide through by t. And when I do that, this term goes away, this term goes away. I'm just left with t partial squared w with respect to x squared equals this. And I'm going to divide through by t. So I get partial squared w with respect to x squared equals 1 over t over m partial squared w with respect to t squared. And this t over m quantity turns out to be the speed of wave propagation in the medium. Okay. And that is the wave equation. Right, and as I've just so we've just found the wave equation for the string just by doing a simple applying Newton's law to a little section of string. You can do that for the vibrate. You can do same thing. Cut out a little section of a beam. Count, do the force balance on it. Set it equal to the mass times acceleration. And for a beam, you'll get a fourth order differential equation, and it's not the wave equation. Still vibrates, but it's not governed by what do we call the wave equation. Okay. So this is the one-dimensional wave equation. This quantity T over M is the phase velocity. It's called phase velocity. You know, that's a good one to remember. For a simple string, the speed of phenomena running down the string is the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length. And if you had, you know, a long string and like I put that little pluck in it, and you can see that pluck running back and forth on it, that's the speed it's going at. It's basically, it's called the, well, so if I have my string and I put a little bump on it and that bump goes zipping along, your eye will see this thing propagating at C. All right.
So to get natural frequencies and mode shapes, we basically need to solve this equation. And it's quite straightforward to do. And a technique known as separation of variables works, which means that all you're doing is saying, I believe that I'm going to be able to write the solution as some function of x only times some function of time only, product of two terms. And that, in fact, for um, because we are interested in vibration, you can tell me what the function of time is. You're going to tell me half the solution, just from observation. What is it? Just the time-dependent part. It's the same as anything else that vibrates. So a single degree to freedom system, what is the time-dependent function that we substitute in to find the natural frequency? Say again? E to the i omega t. E to the i omega t would be just fine. Cosine omega t works, sine omega t works. But e to the i omega t is pretty easy to use because it's so simple to take the derivatives. So we can guess that this is going to be some w of x times a e to the i omega t. All right. And plug it in. Plug it into our wave equation over here. So, make sure I write it consistently. So we plug this into the first term. It's two derivatives with respect to x. So this is just And the time-dependent part just stays outside. And on the uh, right-hand side, when we plug it in here, 1 over c squared, two derivatives with respect to time, it's going to give me minus omega squared. So minus omega squared over c squared. And then it gives me back w of x a e to the i omega t. And now I can get rid of the a e to the i omega t's. And I'm left with just a, an equation involving x only. And it's a, an ordinary differential equation in w of x. So it turns into a d2w dx squared plus omega squared over c squared w equals 0. And that, that you've seen this equation before. Does this not look like, uh, have some similarity to mx double dot plus kx equals 0? OK, the same, basically the same equation. This one's a function of x. That one's a function of time. OK. And we know the solution to this one is some x of t is some amplitude uh, e to the i omega t. So therefore, we can guess that the solution to this one is w of x is going to be, I'll write it as uh, some b. And now I need a function of x, but it can be just like this, e to the i, and I'll say k, x. I know that's going to be a solution. So let's plug it in. If I, if I plug that in, I get uh, minus k squared b e to the i k x plus omega squared over c squared b e to the i k x equals 0. Well, now I get rid of these. And what I found out is that k squared is omega squared over c squared. 
And this has a name, K. It's called the wave number. And it also happens to be 2 pi over lambda. We'll come back to that. Lambda is the wavelength. You have sinusoidal waves running through the medium. 2 pi over lambda is the same as omega over c. And this is called the wave number. Really important quantity if you're trying to understand wave propagation in systems. And actually, and it, this one, this definition applies to all wave-bearing systems, whether or not they obey the wave equation. The, it'll apply to waves traveling down a beam as well. So the definition of wave number is frequency divided by speed or 2 pi over the wavelength. Well, let's see. We can't go much further with this, uh, with just the wave equation itself. We have, in order to get the natural frequencies, we have to invoke other information that we know in the problem. In particular, we know that in order to get natural frequencies, we had to create conditions where this could vibrate. In particular, I fixed that end, and I fixed this end, and I put some tension on it, and now it'll vibrate, but it clearly has something to do with the ends and its length. And so this is a boundary value problem, and we have to invo invoke the boundary conditions to actually finish finding the natural frequencies and mode shapes. Apply the boundary conditions. So this, I assumed here that, that my W of X was going to look something like that. In order to, do, to get a little more information out of than this, I'm going to write now W of X in a form, an alternate form that's equally valid. And I'll call it uh, B1 cosine KX plus a B2 sine KX. And I could relate that to you know, e to the ikx, b e to the ikx by real and imaginary parts and so forth. This is a real part. I'm saying in general it could have a cosine part and also a sine part. But now I know my boundary conditions are w at x equals 0. w of 0 is what? What's the displacement at x equals 0? Hmm? Zero. That's the pin. That's the end where it's fixed at. And this is a, we're started out here with a second order partial differential equation. And a second order equation requires two boundary conditions. A fourth order equation for the beam will require four boundary conditions. We only have to find two. One of them is it has no motion on the left. So you plug in uh, zero for x. Cosine of zero is one. Sine of zero is zero. So we find out that this is b1 times 1, but it has to be 0 as the boundary condition. So that implies B1 is 0. There's no cosines in this answer. And W at L is 0. And so that says B2 sine KL equals 0. And that's true. That's only true if K L equals n pi. So now I've found out that there's just, for, tr for vibration of a finite length string, there's only particular values of k that work. So that says that there are special values of k, which I'll call k sub n, which are equal to n pi over L. And from that, we now have our mode shapes, because we can say, ah, well, there's special solution for this w of x that applies only when we satisfy the boundary conditions. And that will be some undetermined amplitude. b2 came from the sine term.
And those are our mode shapes. And now the natural frequencies, once you know mode shapes, natural frequencies actually can become pretty trivial to find. In this case, if we know that's the uh, uh, mode shape, then how do we get the natural frequencies? Well, we know that, what's the definition of K? Therefore, the, special, the particular values of K it's that we're allowed solutions here are going to be correspond to particular values of omega n. And therefore, omega n squared is just k n squared c squared, and that's n pi over l squared t over m. That's omega n squared. So the natural frequencies of a string are n pi over l root t over m. And then in, this is in radians per second. And we like to, I like to work in hertz sometimes. So the natural frequencies in hertz, omega n over 2 pi. And that becomes n over 2L root t over m. So the, the first natural frequency, F1, is 1 over 2L root t over m. Okay. Now that, let's go back, let's draw. What's the mode shape for the first mode? Well. half a sine wave, vibrates like that. It's full wavelength. I didn't leave myself quite enough room. That's half a wavelength, right, of a sine wave. So the full wavelength would be like that. This is of length L. And so is this piece over here. So the lambda is 2L for this particular problem. How long? Let's see, how do I want to pose this question? So how long does it take for a wave or a disturbance to travel the length of the, this finite string? How long does it take to go down there and back? How would you calculate that? Distance equals rate times time. What's the, what's the distance? 2L. What's the speed? C. So the length of time ought to be 2L over C, right? So the time required and two L divided by T over M, but F one is T over M divided by two L. Hmm. So the period, so there is a direct connection between propagation speed, frequencies, wavelengths. They're very closely related. So the natural frequency of the first mode of this string, that frequency is exactly 1 over the length of time it takes for a disturbance to travel down and back. So with that depth of understanding of how um, the wave equation behaves, you can 
you can guess the behavior of lots of other things that behave like that, like my rod here. I'll do a little demo with it in a second. So for example, so this, the longitudinal vibration, stress waves running up and down this thing, obey the wave equation. So if I take this thing and drop it on the floor, it'll bounce off the floor. How long does it take to bounce off the floor? So what do you think actually, what physics has to have, you know, what's required to make this thing bounce off the floor. So let's, we're going to consider the floor infinitely rigid. It hits the floor. It actually stays there for some finite length of time, and then it leaves. So physically, when I was holding up my string, if I smacked the end, what happened? The pulse took off, ran down the end, reflected, came back, and that was one round trip. What do you suppose happens here? I put a pulse into the end. Is it a tension or compression, the strain that's felt? Compression. So a little compression pulse is put into the end. That compression pulse then, it, when it first hits, the compression and the speed of propagation is finite, so that compression wave starts traveling up here. Behind the compression wave, this rod has come to a stop. In front of the compression wave, the rod doesn't know it hit the ground yet. It's still moving down. So the uh, compression wave travels up, bring in, it is decelerating each little slice of mass as it passes through. It brings it to a stop. And so the compression red, we, we, it reaches the top end. The cylinder has come to a stop. The end is free. It can't take any strain. So an equal and opposite tension wave has to start to make it, the sum of them go to zero at the end. The boundary condition of the end is no strain. So it reflects a tension wave. Now you have a tension wave going down, and what it does is it accelerates every atom as it goes by, as it goes past it. So everything is stopped now. Now it starts down, and this peak, the part, this thing starts rebounding from the top, rebounds from the floor before the bottom does. The top starts going up. All of it, it can, more and more goes up, and when it hits the bottom, the tension wave hits the floor, and it jumps off. So how long does it take? Right? And what do you guess the natural frequency of a free, free rod is? Now, it has a funny mode shape. The mode shape is not half a sine wave like this. The, dis the displacement of the rod has free ends. The ends are moving a lot. But I'll give you a clue. I can hold it in the center and not damp it. What do you think the mode shape looks like? Half a wavelength long, ends are free, cosine, maximum displacement goes to zero, maximum negative displacement. So it's half a wavelength long, but it's a cosine half a wavelength. And the whole full wavelength is 2L, all right? So this has mode shapes. The mode shapes, I've applied different boundary conditions. These are free, free boundary conditions. The mode shapes are cosine n pi x over L. But they have to obey a certain, another law that we know about, the conservation of momentum. If I'm, I'm, because I've got gravity to deal with, I have to hang on to this thing. But I've picked a place to hang on to it that you've, you can hear it. I am not affecting the motion. There's no motion where I'm holding it. So if I were out in space, I could do this and just let it hang there in space, right? And it would sit there and ring. What is happening to the center of mass of this system as it vibrates? Stationary. So half of the mass of this thing's got to be moving that way, and half of the mass has to be moving that way so that the total center of mass doesn't move. Well, cosine mode shape, positive here. Negative there, perfectly symmetric, center of mass doesn't move. 
So there's all sorts of neat little problems that you can solve uh, to just by knowing the wave equation and figuring out boundary conditions. Okay, how you know how many of you stand in the shower and hum and sing and you know and every now and then, every now and then you hit a note. Man, you just sound great, right? <laughs> you know, just all this reverberation. How many of you done that? Okay, right. What's going on? You've hit a nat somebody said natural frequency of what? Huh? You've hit the nat you've the you have hit the natural frequency of the shower stall itself. You know, if the shower stall is a meter across, pressure waves, and you plot pressure inside of the uh, shower stall. The lowest mode, and if you're plotting pressure, well, let's plot actually molecular movement. What's the boundary condition at the wall? The molecules at the wall can't move, right? Zero. So the molecular motion at resonance in the shower stall, the molecules, the pressure is making them move back and forth, looks like back to the string again. This is L, the first natural frequency of sound waves bouncing off the walls in the stall is. Uh, 1 over 2L uh, root times uh, C, whatever C is. And in C is the speed of sound in air, which is 340 meters per second. So 340 meters per second divided by 2L. So if it's one meter across here, it's 340 divided by 2, 170 hertz. So that first note you can hit in the one meter across shower style is about 170 hertz. Pretty low, okay? But you could hit second mode, be twice that and so forth, okay? What about an organ pipe? This is an organ pipe, wood. It's got a stoppered end. Actually, let's do it without the stopper. Now it's an open organ pipe. <laughs> Basic wave equation. How would you model its boundary conditions? So you can talk about maybe particle mo molecular motion, just like this is now, again, it's just sound waves. So air particles, and this is now longitudinal, things are moving inside. So what's the boundary condition at this end? Free or fixed? Free. And here it's quite open. So the boundary condition down here is free. So for the mo molecular motion in the organ, free, free organ pipe, the um, you can get back to that half a wavelength cosine thing. And if you wanted to plot pressure instead, you can write the wave equation in terms of pressure. Pressure is, is this pressure relief here and pressure relief there. So in fact, this, if this is um, displacement of the molecules, pressure would plot like that. You'd have pressure, what's called a pressure relief boundary condition. But again, it's a half wavelength long. What do you think the first natural frequency of this organ pipe is? Well, the, the period would be 2L over C. The frequency would be C over 2L. OK. So the frequency for the organ pipe open end, F1 is C over 2L. Now, check your intuition. I'm going to close the end. It's still an organ pipe. Is the frequency now going to be higher or lower? Take a vote. How many think the frequency is going to go up? Raise your hands. Commit. All right, down. And a lot of uncertainty? All right, let's do the experiment. How come? I find that actually kind of counterintuitive. Until I learned this, I would have guessed the opposite way. What's going on with pressure in a closed pipe? Well, here at the orifice, where the sound is actually generated, it's the pressure. If we wanted to plot pressure at the opening, that's a pressure relief place, so it's zero. 
But at the other end, where the stopper is, it's maximum. How many wavelengths is that? A quarter. And so in order, for the length of time it takes for the thing to go through one complete period is going to be 4L over C. Half the frequency of the open pipe. OK, so the, way you could, the wave equation is really quite powerful. It governs lots of things. I want, so I've got 10, 15 minutes left here. I don't want you to go away thinking that the whole world behaves like the wave equation, because there are some important other physical systems that we care about. And the most, I'm going to show you just one, and that's the uh, vibration of the beam. So here's cantilever beam. Whole table's moving. And it's, you can see it up on the screen. OK, so it's, it's first mode vibration. Tip moves maximum. Kind of looks like, uh, like a quarter wavelength. It's roughly is, but not exactly. So let's draw a cantilever. And you know, most of you have had two 001, so if you put a load P out here, bends, goes through a displacement delta. So you know that delta equals P L cubed over 3 E I, right? And what's this I? Area moment of inertia, right? We, now that you've got, we've been doing dynamics all term, we talk about mass moments of inertia. There's also area moments of inertia. So this is the area moment of inertia of a beam. In this case, our beam is a little rectangular cross section. And the neutral axis is here, a little variable y, a displacement i is the integral of y squared dA. And dA is just a little slice of area here, dA. The integral of y squared dA is your cross-sectional area moment of inertia in the direction of bending. Okay? It helps, so that is I. I happens, you can also write it as a kappa squared A. And that's, we, had, we ran into this in dynamics. We call it the radius of gyration. You have the same thing in, with area moments of inertia, the radius of gyration. This is going to be really helpful in a second. So if you solve the force balance for a beam like I did for the string. Take a little slice. Do force balance for transverse motions. I'm not going to grind it out. And, and temporarily neglect external forces and damping. I want to get to the natural frequencies and mode shapes. So the free vibration, no damping equation looks like E I partial 4 W with respect to x to the fourth plus rho A partial squared W with respect to T squared equals 0. Now this is density, mass density, and the A this A is the area of the cross section. You know, so it's just some BH, right? With thick, thickness times the width. So rho times A is a mass per unit length. And so mass per unit length times dx would be the little mass associated with the element, times the acceleration should be the forces on the element. So that's the fourth order partial differential equation that describes the vibration of a beam. And you have to, where we saw, you have to apply the boundary conditions. 
And for the string, it was just a B1 cosine, B2 sine. For the beam, it's B1 cosine plus B2 sine plus C2 cosh plus D2 cinch x. And then you have to apply four boundary conditions and solve for you know, B1, B2, and so forth, all four, can, all four of those. I won't do it, but that's how you do it. Separation and separation of variables works again. So we solve this, apply the boundary conditions. Apply the boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions? Just so you understand what I mean by the boundary conditions, what are they for a free, free beam? Zero motion at the wall. Um, no strain at the end, no bending moment at the end, no shear force at the end, so there's no second derivative, no third derivative. Uh, and at the wall, there, the slope is zero, the first derivative. No slope comes into the wall, but doesn't, the slope is zero there. So those are the different kind of boundary conditions. So every different, so you have a free, free beam, you have no bending at either end, and no strain at either end. Fix, fix beam, no displacement, zero slopes at both ends, and all different combinations. And every different combination gives you different natural frequencies. So you apply the boundary conditions, and for a beam, you find out that for all beams, omega n can be written as some beta n, a parameter, squared, I'll call it, times the square root of e i over rho a. And this thing varies according to the boundary conditions. Okay. Now that's what you get shown in every textbook in the world, which you, what, something. But and I have a very hard time visualizing this. You know, you know, getting physical intuition by that. But so something you never see in a textbook. But I often do is let's replace I with kappa squared A. And you get a square root of e over rho and the square root of i over a, but i is kappa squared a, the a is canceled, it's the square root of kappa. Ka square root of kappa squared. So this, and what's, you know what e over rho is? e over rho, square root of e over rho is the sound speed in a solid material. So the speed of that stress waves traveling up and down this thing is the square root of E over rho. For this is a low movement, about, it's about 4,000 meters a second. So if you know just the properties of the material, you have that, and that says then the omega n for beams is some beta n squared a parameter times kappa CL, and this thing this is often written CL, it's the longitudinal sound speed. This is sound speed for waves traveling through the medium. So this tells you, if you make the beam twice as thick, what do you do to its natural frequencies? Doubles. Instantly you know that. So bending properties depend a lot on the radius of gyration. And I'll give you a few natural frequencies for different boundary conditions, just so you see what they behave like. So the pin, pin, pin beam looks like that. So this is a, you put a plank across the stream, you know, rocks on both sides, you got a pin, pin beam, basically. You sit there and rock. So some length L has properties EI. So the natural frequencies for a pin, pin beam, the beta ends are just n pi over L. And so your natural frequencies, omega n, looks like n pi over L, quantity squared, kappa CL. And for the cantilever, for 
for the cantilever, the natural frequencies look like omega n. Pi squared over 4 L squared is the beta n. And I'll write it this way again, E i over rho a. You can always go back and do that, or you can call it kappa cl. This is also kappa cl. But then there's a, there are some numbers you've got to use here. 1.194 squared, that's the first mode. Second mode, 2.988 squared. And then after that, 5 squared, 7 squared, 9 squared. So that's the natural, so this is the natural frequency of a cantilever. Pi squared over 4L squared times 1.194 squared kappa CL. That's this natural frequency. And a one final case, because I can show it to you, the free free case. So that's a beam in bending that vibrates like that. And I happen to know on a beam for the first mode of a beam, this is the first mode of a beam, where these nodes are, where there's no motion, I should be able to hold it there and not damp it. And that turns out to be at about the quarter points. So whack it like that. And do it again. All right, so I want you to hold it. Not right there. Nope, can't hold it like that, though. You just got to balance it, because you got to be right where the node is. You can hear that little bit lower tone. That's that free, free bending mode, and it's just sitting. You can feel it vibrating a little bit, right, but not much. You're, when you're, you're right in the right spot, you're right on the mode shape. You can almost see it if you hit it hard enough. So that's the free, free beam, and the free, free beam has natural frequencies omega n. Again, pi squared over 4L squared. Kappa CL, 3.0112 squared. 5 squared, 7 squared, 9 squared. So as you go up and in. So those are the natural frequencies of a free free beam. Oh, one last fact. One last fact about beams. So let's say I have, this is now a steel beam under no tension. It can support its own weight. Long, though. So it can, can a beam support waves traveling down the beam? Transverse waves traveling down the beam. What do you think? Well, if it can support this, it can probably support waves, right? So waves will propagate in a beam, even though this is fourth order par partial differential equation. But how fast do they go? That's the question. Okay. So this is a beam, and I want to know about waves traveling down it. And I'm not going to go through, this would take another hour or so to show you where this comes from. But the, here's my beam. Here's a disturbance traveling along it with some speed that I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it CT. It's transverse wave speed. It's the speed you'd see a crest of a wave moving at, running down that beam. C CT for a beam. Square root of omega kappa CL. And CL, again, is the square root of E over rho. That's the speed of sound in the material. That property, that just turns up in here. So what does this tell you about the uh, frequency dependence of the speed? Does the speed change with frequency? Omega kappa CL, right? It's proportional to frequency. High frequency waves go faster than low frequency waves in a beam. 
we, I didn't emphasize it when we were talking about it, but the wave equation, what was C for the string for the wave equation, the speed of sound, the speed of wave propagation was square root of T over M. Was it frequency dependent? All waves travel at the same speed. And so there's an important consequence. So for anything that obeys the wave equation, the speed of propagation is a constant and independent of frequency. So I can make any initial shape that I make in this thing and let it go. It's initial disturbance. That little shape will stay that shape and run up and down the thing forever. And that shape, you can imagine a little pluck like this to start with. You can imagine doing a, make, you know, doing a Fourier series to approximate that. It would be made up of a bunch of different Fourier components, right? Um, and yet, for a, something that obeys a wave equation, it, that little pluck will just stay the shape of that pluck and run around forever. But not so in a beam. If you did that in a beam, if you come up and put an impulse into a beam, all that energy would start out together, but in very brief time, the high frequency information would get out in front of the low frequency information. And if you were way down this beam, and somebody up a mile away whacks one end, and you're down further along, you'll, say, you'll see high frequency waves pass you, and then lower frequency, and finally really slow ones coming by, the really long waves. So that's called dispersion. So beam waves are dispersive. Things that obey the wave equation are non-dispersive. The energy all travels at the same speed independent of frequency. All right, so that's the, uh, that's it for the term. I'll see you guys on next Wednesday.